Hello everyone, Nary here from Drake Wing Gaming. So if you know me on Twitter, the Gaming Dragon. Today I'm coming at you another Let's Play episode of Echo. It is all dark and cloudy today. You may have some storms passing through, so I'm gonna go ahead and get my recordings done. But it does provide a nice creepy atmosphere to the Echo series. So let's jump right in and see where the evening takes us, shall we? <laughs> Alright, alarm chain, you're up. Alright, guys, sit back and enjoy. <clears throat> Alright. Alright, now which one was this? Oh, I can't go back. Okay. Oh, I'll just assume that's the guy. I don't know, hun. You tell me. You reckon it's working? Oh, her tone is flirty, and I can practically feel them both smiling. I'm outside now. My head's spinning. I'm walking, but it's, it's my, my body that's moving. It's someone else's. The movements are slow and deliberate. A stab of pain when the body's left leg moves too high or the joint rotates at the knees. The fur on their arms is ice white and the muzzle is feline. Some sort of a big albino cat trudging one foot after the other beside the highway, caught up in a strange daze. Sepia-tinted memories fill our head of places that look straight out of the southwestern adventure's frontier quarter. These recollections are his existence, and the physical reality in front of him a fading dream, something that causes pain to, diver to traverse. This world is not his home anymore, as much as it hurts him to think that. One of his feet steps upon the pavement, then the other, crossing the lanes to walk directly down the little yellow line down the center. The people he loved are all dead, but he doesn't want to join them. He just wants them back. As his own senses fail him, the memories in his head keep getting more and more real. They're there in his mind. He can see the stitching in their clothing, the smell of their fur, the chuckle in their voice, the touch of their paws, the taste of their lips. It's such a sad way to be. I'm back in the van. The otter and coyote are treating glances with each other now. The more brusque personality of the otter seems tempered by the coyote, like he's trying not to take himself too seriously around her. The radio is playing something now, something that was there before I couldn't quite make it out. It's not music, just voices drawn out, distorted, mostly unintelligible. I catch something that sounds like nervous laughter from a high-pitched voice. Then a more baritone one responds with something reassuring. It's okay. At least that's what I think it says. Finally, a squelching noise, like squishing soft putty between your paws. The feeling that something behind me in the van grows. I've been here before. I know I have. But when? No matter what I do, I can't turn around. Even the rear view mirror reflects a distorted image. I can just barely make out something back there, undulating in constant restless motion, strobing between pulsating flashes of faint red light. There's applause, like someone clapping. The handles of the rear cabin doors seem to shudder and click, like someone is trying to open them from the outside. But that's impossible. We're moving. It feels like I'm yanked back out to the road again, with the old man walking down the center line. The memories in his head grow more per grow more pers perspicu perspicuous okay grow more perspicuous as he walks it's as if it's building towards some great zenith or a point of total clarity i'm not sure how i know this there's a rumbling of an engine coming up from behind puttering in rhythmic fashion again i can't turn to face it but i know it's there and it's getting closer the engine roars it's coming straight up behind me this is nuts <laughs> fuck what the fuck am i doing the high-pitched voice from the radio. I can hear it now, clearer than ever. Oh. Ooh. You're doing great, Chula. The baritone voice. That was Leo? The albino older man stops, turning as if he heard this, too. Heavy breaths escape my throat and splay forth, fogging up the windshield. The two lovers exchange a kiss, eyes lulled. Their lovers in the back as well, fumbling with themselves in that same red light. That same red light that bathes the entire sky. The cabin doors fling open and I can finally see the person who's been trying to get in from outside. A runty-looking amber-eyed otter stands there, wearing an oversized blue shirt and khaki shorts. It's... me. I'm younger and I don't have the goatee. Somehow I'm just floating behind the moving vehicles as if I were standing still. The color, is, the color in younger me's eyes starts to fade before shifting to an icier blue. He shrinks, and soon the figure standing there is a little boy in his swimming trunks. Him. What does he want? Another shift, and he springs about up with distorted, jolty movements. 
The transition is nowhere near as smooth as the first. An otter in his hunting cap, far too tight for his head, those same blue eyes piercing right through me. Bronson. Mr. Bronson. Sydney's father. Is Mr. Bronson also the one driving the van we're in? I see no reaction from the blurry figure in the driver's seat, still more occupied with the coyote next to him. He's only there for a second before his face practically tears away in jagged artifacting. Mr. Bronson twists in on himself, expression uncaring as it falls apart and fades into ragged white fur. The elderly albino on the road. It's him. At least, I think it is. His silhouette is more abstracted, the detail of his features somewhat darker. His form floats there for some time. I keep waiting for it to shift, but it doesn't. Instead, it turns its head to look directly at me with stark red eyes. They widen, still peering, and I try to step back, but I can't move. Like fluorescent bulbs, they begin to illuminate, blinding me as they grow closer and closer. I hold up my paw, just as the old man's mouth opens, able, about to speak. What? Thunk. Janice, you okay? Bronson? Bronson, what did you hear? Bronson! Bronson, don't just sit there! You answer me right now! <clears throat> I... I don't know! Jesus, sweet Mary Christ! Mr. Bronson is despondent. Well, Jan... Janice is starting to get frantic. Everything's dark, but I can still see a slight red splatter on the center of the windshield. A large chunk of fur is caught in the wiper. Mr. Bronson steps out of the vehicle, his blurry form f flickering into something a little more focused. His clothes are loose hanging, jeans bell bottom, very 60s. I can see the whiskers on his face, like they were my own. His heart is practically beating out of his chest, his fur damp with cold sweat. The fear is electric, buzzing hum which permeates the landscape. Are they hearing it too? I decide to move with him, seeing from his point of view. Mr. Bronson covers his face, paws trembling. He can't see anything in this darkness. Uh. The otter nearly leaps out of his fur, startled by the voice. It's a weak, desperate cry, a gurgling of pain following it immediately after. Mr. Bronson runs to the source of the pathetic sound, Janice getting out of the van as well. She clutches her bag to her side, her high heels clacking against the asphalt. Bronson! Oh my god! I see it. I see him. The albino feline is stuck, wedged between the fender skirt and the wheel itself, a space about a foot wide. He's practically folded into it. Leg snapped upward and jutting out to the side. Wild red eyes dart from Mr. Bronson to Janice and back again. I can't tell if he's pleading for help or asking why. All I know is that he's in excruciating pain, beyond the capacity for tears, just instant shock. Images flash before his eyes, and now he's not looking at anyone at all. He's devoid of movement beyond the rapid heaving of his chest. Jesus! She screams. His shoulder's caught under the tire! And he's bleeding! Oh God, Bronson, we gotta do something! I know we gotta do something! He shouts back at her, eyes nearly popping out of his head. J Jack! Janice grasps it, grasps. Janice gasps as the old man begins to speak again. A look of realization crosses her no longer blurry face as she points towards the back of the van. Get the jack! Mr. Bronson blinks and quickly rushes to the back to get his toolkit, flinging the doors open. In place of obscure lovers are a mound of tarantulas, burrowing into each other as if trying to hide from the newly opened doors. Some are blondes, while others are more of the standard rust and black color. He does not seem to notice or care about these creatures, which flee from his presence, instead diving for his little olive toolbox. I try to step away, but I'm stuck seeing through his eyes now. He flings his tools around, hammers, wrenches, and rebar clattering to the side. No Jack. Mr. Bronson stares, motionless until Janice's shrieking voice breaks the silence. What is taking you so long? Get him out of there, Bronson! The otter exhales shakily and makes his way back to Janice, giving her a blank look. Help me lift! What? I said, help me lift! You're kidding me! You don't have a jack? Shut up and help! Mr. Bronson slips his paws under the side of the van next to the wheel, squeezing his palms against the chrome. Janice quickly does the same on the other side of the wheel. On three, lift! Mr. Old Man, we're gonna get at you, get you out of there in no time. You just gotta slide, a f just gotta slide on free once this goes up, okay? 
She tried to put on a reassuring voice, but the albino just stares past her with those intense red eyes. One! Bronson, I don't know if I can do this! Two! She shakes the tears beginning to well within her eyes. Oh, God! Three! The van creaks as it begins to rise up off the ground, at least on this corner. Janice screams at her own exertions, muscles spasming as her arms shake. I can't! The old man begins sliding his broken legs down to the side of the wheel, one of his free paws grabbing the side of the fender skirt. Low moans escape from inside his chest, whimpers of unimaginable pain and shock as his crushed bones realign themselves inside him. He makes it most of the way out by the time Janice's arms give out, the van instantly lowering back down a couple inches. I'm sorry! Fuck! Mr. Bronson spreads his legs wide, his muscles quivering as he tries to hold up the whole van by himself. Go, go, get out of there! He screams down at the albino, his blue eyes meeting the albino's as the old feline begins to nudge himself out from under the wheel. N no! The otter howls as the van continues to lower despite his best efforts. The old man feels it touch the side of his muzzle. His breathing quickens, his arms reaching for something, anything to help him. Then some gentle pressure. His eyes are bleary and moist now, like a lost child's. Then more pressure. And then... Janice screams. She screams and screams until her vocal cords fray like old yarn. Time passes. The body of the old man is dragged into a large, open hole in the side of the road. Mr. Bronson's paws are bloodied, nails chipped from digging without a shovel. Janice refused to help, and she's been sitting in the van quietly for the past half hour, crying to herself. She can't stop shaking. He buries the body in the small ditch, trying not to look at his half-crushed face. It seems to stare at him, asking for help from beyond the grave. He could have helped, but he wasn't strong enough. Maybe this is what he wanted, after all. To die. Why else would he have been walking straight toward them in the middle of the road? He had plenty of time to move out of the way, but he didn't. It was like he didn't realize the shock of what he had done until he was tangled in the wheel skirt of the van. His bones jutting from his skin and blood dripping over from his overalls. Once he's completely covered, Mr. Bronson peers back at the van. The splatter from the impact is still visible. He places a small stone to mark the grave of the unknown man before heading back and getting into the driver's seat. Janice says nothing to him, and for that, he's thankful. Mr. Bronson drives off the road into a small valley a short ways away. He parks in between some, bush, some bushes and collects his things, trying to ignore the new throbbing pain in his head. Together, they silently exit the van and begin their slow walk back to Echo. A lone figure watches them from atop a hill, an impossibly tall silhouette with lanky arms that hang past his knees. We're together now. Oh, f fuck that was weird. Creepy as fucking fuck. <laughs> My eyes flutter open and I'm greeted by sunlight pouring through the thin curtains. At first, I'm a little confused until I realize I'm not in the same bed I've been in the rest of the trip. It takes me a minute to get control of my limbs again, and when I turn my head to the side, I see Jenna sound asleep beside me. The way the sunrise is shining through her blonde fur is just perfect. It's such a contrast to the dream from the night before, the details of which are already starting to fade, but some of the imagery remains. The van... The albino getting hit, the tarantulas in the back, the tall figure that was watching on the hill. Ugh, it just hurts to think about. I reach out a paw and gingerly stroke Jenna's shoulder. Seeing as TJ is out of the room, I scoop myself up behind her in optimal spooning position. Fortunately, thanks to the dream, I have awoken without morning wood for a change. The moment I touch her, though, she rolls around, nuzzling her muzzle into the nape of my neck. Her whiskers tickle at my chin, and I have to make a concerted effort not to start giggling. She must not be happy. She must not be as asleep as I'd thought, because she makes a contented noise as I run my paw down to her hip. She takes hold of my paw in hers and leans forward to kiss me. Not open mouth or anything gross and morning breathy like that, but enough to make my heart flutter. Her eyes open a crack and she smiles as she sees me looking back at her. Hey. Hey. I peck her on the nose and I can hear her tail thwap beneath the covers happily. <laughs> you look beautiful. Hmm, <laughs> truly. She inquires back, stretching her arms above her and yawning. <laughs> yeah. She squints at me for a moment. You have sleep crusties in your eyes. 
I blink. Oh, well, I just woke up. That's probably why. I rub my eyes quickly. She lets out a little laugh. You sleep okay? I debate just saying yeah and leaving it at that, but last night's dream felt so particularly bizarre, I'd feel wrong not to mention. Eh. I shrug. More weird dreams. I had one where I was simultaneously where I simultaneously got hit by and ran over someone with a van. Like the perspective switched back and forth. Oh, that's weird. At least it's not the recurring shadow you dream. Oh yeah, definitely. Seeing myself in the mirror is tough enough. I don't need to see that when I sleep. Chase, please. You're not that ugly. I frown. You have a wonderful way of making your reassurances simultaneously slight slight put downs. Do I? Yes. I'm being negged. Oh, shut up. I hate when guys do that. I'm just teasing you, Chase. Trying to rate someone's physical appearance has always been hard for me. Especially when they're covered in eye gunk. Bah! Oh, come on! I'm gonna wipe it on you. Her face crinkles into a look of repulsion. <laughs> oh, gross! I pull her body close to mine, her chest pressed together. This softens her scowl a bit. You know, I keep dreaming about my grandmother. Really? Yes, it's strange. Especially the one from last night. She pauses. I wait, looking at her expectantly. I was younger and in my bedroom back at my parents' place. Well, it didn't look like my bedroom and everything was kind of hazy, but I could hear that old, old hot water heater in the morning. I was being read a story from one of those children's books with the golden spines. You know, yeah. <clears throat> you know the ones, right? I nod. Oh yeah, wow. I hadn't thought about those in ages. My parents used to read them to me all the time when I was little. Couldn't fall asleep without them. No, I can't recall ever being read a story outside of school, and so that's why it was a bit unusual. Who was reading the story, then? Hold on, I'll get to that in a second. The story was a fairly basic medieval fairy tale, with the king having been eaten by a dragon, and a brave warrior venturing out to slay the beast. Despite it being a story I was being told, it was kind of like I was watching it all happen for real, like on TV. The warrior travels a great distance to confront this dragon, but when they finally find him, they falter. Inside the dragon's lair, the warrior finds a baby dragon, whom the big one was trying to protect. The king had wanted the dragons dead, stating that they were all monstrous, uncaring devils. But at seeing the big dragon protect his young, the warrior knows that this is not the whole truth and spares the dragon. Hmm, noble guy. It wasn't a guy. In fact, I believe it was my grandmother? The one you told me about? Yes. How do you know that? Yuna's brow furrows slightly as she thinks. I'm not sure exactly. At the time, I felt I felt it felt implicit, obvious. Like who else could it be? So warrior grandma doesn't kill the dragon, and then what happens? Her gaze shifts as if searching for something fleeting. I don't think anything happened. It just sort of hard cut back to my bedroom. I could see the sun just starting to rise through the window. The still or the sky is still orangey red. You know, like how it gets during a drought when there's lots of dust in the air. Despite all this, the room looked even darker. I couldn't see who was reading the story to me, just that they had big red eyes. And then I woke up. That last part sounds familiar for some reason, but I'm having a difficult time remembering why. Wow? Jenna looks slightly embarrassed with herself, fussing with her head for as she sits up some. Discussing dreams can be a great way to help in discern internal stressors in one's life. Her tone is slightly defensive, the finick using words uh, words way too fancy for this or for this early in the morning. The problem is dreams are often deeply personal abstractions that she stops frowning to herself some and then glances at the clock on the nightstand. It's probably gonna be our turn on search duty here in a bit. The information we got from Misha is really helpful if true. Here's hoping he pulls through with his investigating. Yeah, to be honest, I was kind of a lot happier in thinking Carl just went on a bender and got lost somewhere. He still might have, judging by how you said Misha described him acting. At least we know the general direction to at least we know the general direction to to look. Right. Look at the neatly made bed on TJ's side of the room. He had intentionally given us a bit of a strange look when I mentioned I was going to bunk with Jenna tonight. I can't tell if, I can't tell if that's because he was curious about a relationship or offended that I wasn't sleeping with him. <laughs> I clarified that he didn't snore just in case. Jenna's phone vibrates beside us, and she lets out a little sigh, clearly comfortable and not wanting to move. If I had longer arms, I'd grab it for you. Oh, such a gentleman. Don't worry, you're pretty long. You're plenty long, Chase. She winks at me before rolling over and grabbing her phone. I stare ahead with the biggest goddamn grin on my face. 
Definitely one of the better ego boosts I've received in recent years. Right up there with when the hipster barista girl at the downtown coffee shop told me I had had foreign rock star vibes. <laughs> oh, that's, that's good. I like that. Whatever that means. She taps away at her phone for a moment before looking over at me. Gonna meet with TJ down at the diner for breakfast. Some eggs and bacon sounds amazing to me right now. I'm usually not the sort of person who gets hungry as soon as I wake up, but that does sound pretty good. Yeah, with some jam and toast, too. Now you're talking. She gives me my rump a little pat and a heavy tail thump against my against the mattress. What, you two not gonna take a shower together? <laughs> oh, I'm so... I'm really enjoying the, the relationship these two have. It's so playful and cute. And there's a lot of back and forth. It's so much healthier than the relationship he has with Leo. God, Leo is such a messed up person. I mean, I... Leo is not good for Chase at all. He's not kind of person that he is currently no it, it, he just he just be doing more harm than good anyway guys thank you so much for watching don't forget to like comment excuse me subscribe and ring that little notification bell to the next video i love you all i'll see you next time Bye bye